Well, Jonesy, the customary uh, life admin slash general boring topics uh, discussion out the way. Um, now we have to get into the nitty gritty, which apparently is why people listen to this podcast is because they actually want to hear us talk about West Ham and football. <laughs> Um, news to me, I know, 200 episodes in. <laughs> yeah. um, a one-all draw at Southampton at the weekend. Declan Rice, who scored the equaliser and celebrated it like we'd just won the FA Cup final. Um, he said after the game, he was talking quite in quite a positive fashion. I don't know whether that was more of a, I'm the captain, I have to put a positive spin on this. Um, and... You know, I don't know. It's one all away from home. And on one hand, you sort of go, oh, well, it's a point away from home. That's always good. When your home games draw away, you're going to be in a decent position. Respect the point and all that, yeah. All of that, those usual, usually trotted out football cliches. However, I don't know if there is any football cliches for how much respect you should put on a point against one of the dodgiest looking teams in the whole league. Uh, who can't really buy a win at the moment, haven't been able to for a long, long time, looked very shaky. Um, and with a manager who's under pressure, oh, I don't know. It's not exactly the most intimidating of atmospheres to go and play in. I mentioned already a couple of times, I mentioned it last week, um, that I saw Southampton at St Mary's a couple of weeks ago against Everton, and they were not very good. They were clearly the second best team against a team who had also been struggling for form. That was a low quality game. Everton managed to, to grind out what was a deserved win. And I was really hopeful that West Ham were going to do the same. And it, I can't really escape the feeling that it feels like we've left two points behind at St Mary's rather than it's one point gained. I mean, I, I mean I'm in the same mind as you, mate, in that you look at it, in hindsight, and go, well, maybe you should look at it as, as a good point away from home. But if you actually look at the stats, it's actually ridiculous how we didn't win that game. 61% possession, 25 attempts on goal, 14 corners. Um, and somehow didn't, didn't win the game. Only four shots on target out of those 25. I mean, that tells the story in itself is that, you know, finishing in the final third wasn't good enough. 12 of our shots were blocked. So, I don't know. I, th I just think there were a number of a number of things that didn't go our way. Um, we'll get onto those, I'm sure. But just things like Paquette hitting the post with that header, um, you know, mm. two inches to the right, and it's a goal. Um, and he did the right thing by heading it where he headed it. It was just unlucky. Um, Bazanu in goal, like, but pulled off a couple of really good saves from Skamaka. Um, just wasn't our day in front of goal, and then you, you need Deccan Rice to pop up with 25 yards to curl one in. Um, it, it just wasn't our day in front of goal, but I did f feel like it was just so much frustration in that final third. Mm. Um, everyone's raving about Skamaka, and I thought he had a really, really good game, but I felt like there was a number of occasions where just too many touches, too many touches on the ball, where he could have yeah. he, he had an opportunity to make a bit of space or. You know, playing a player, and by the time he's got around to doing that, he's been closed down by 11 Southampton players, and they're all up jumping on his back because he's so big. Yeah. Um, just little things like that. Just like, oh, you know, there's that pass that Bowen's running clean there, but he's taken two more touches, and suddenly that pass is either harder to make or is off. Um, I just don't know. And it will learn, it will learn the hard way on that front, and that, you know, you don't get a lot of time on the ball. Probably, uh, mm. you probably could have played that game in Italy. Um, but he hasn't got time to take four or five touches before releasing the ball. Um, but all round, he had a really good game. He was a threat. You know, he had a couple of good chances. Um, but it was a good performance, I felt. Um, but, you know, you go behind to a goal like that, you give yourself a, a job to do. And um, then when you're not converting 20, at least more than one of your 25 attempts on goal, then yeah. it's, it's just, again, it's another problem. So um, I look back at it and go, okay, we didn't lose. It's a point. Um, but, like you said, Southampton were there for the taking. Mm. Um, and they played well in stages, but we had more of the ball. Um, we're far better than them going forward. Shay Adams called, caused us a lot of problems. Um, and I'm expecting the score, given that we had no centre-backs on the pitch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But then when you consider that, maybe it's a, maybe it's a good thing that we you know we only considered one. I don't know. But, but yeah, they were there for the taking. We didn't capitalise on that. 
Um, partly that that was our fault, partly not. Um, but we kind of just got to put that behind us now, and you know, look at it as you know, we're unbeaten in three in the league, five in all competitions. Um, we're a far cry from the beginning of the season when we couldn't score a goal and we couldn't get a win. So, um, got to look at it like that. I think that's the way I'm looking at it anyway. Yeah, I just sort of felt that after the dodgy start we had to the beginning of the season, that would have been a win to sort of, you know, as good as, you know, like almost get us back on track about where we'd sort of want to be. It would almost have balanced it out from the beginning of the season, points-wise. Mm. Um, yeah, I just sort of think, I don't know, it's just that it's more of a feeling of disappointment as opposed to, you know, if you go to, I don't know, if you'd gone to Everton, for example, and got a point, you probably go, yeah, okay, fair enough. There's that, you know what I mean? There's that bracket in there. You go to Newcastle and get a point this year, it'd be a good point. Yeah. There's there's a bracket of teams, isn't there, where you think if we go away and get a point away, um, it's a it's a it's a decent result. And there's a lot of teams in the Premier League, I would say that. You know, anyone who sort of finished twelfth and above last year and you get a point there. I think it's a good thing. But it's funny you say that about Skamaka because what I have loved, and it's a weird thing that can be constu- construed, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. construed. That's not no, even construed. That's two other words yeah. I've put together, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, construed makes me think of apple strudel, which is why I didn't want to go construed. But <laughs> finally, that's episode and construed that I've uh, <clears throat> struggled with this week. So, um, <laughs> I don't even know what I was going to say. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this can be construed as a positive or a negative. But what I enjoyed is seeing our striker have some shots. Like, yeah. from what I, and, and people will go, oh, yeah, but, you know, load of them were off target and a load of them missed or easy saves. And I, I do sort of get that. I understand that. And I don't want him to just be shooting from literally anywhere just so we come off at the end of every game having had 25 shots. But if 20 of those are from positions where they're never actually going to go in and you're just doing it to say you had a shot or to make it look dangerous, then that's obviously a waste of time and inefficient use of our time and energy. But I just think, when was the last time you remember Mikhail Antonio having a shot? like from somewhere a little bit different or making something happen or testing the goalie or putting the goalie on edge. Cause all right. And you know, you do, you'd hope that Skamaka and a few of those that whistled past the post or the crossbar at the weekend, he, hopefully he's just getting his eye in a bit and a few of them will sharpen up. And we've seen he's hit a couple of beautiful efforts. So already, mm. and you would have never, ever, I mean, the goal um, away at Anderlecht that Skamaka scored, uh, the one the other week, home to Wolves, was it? I think mm. um, you'd never ever see Antonio score goals like that, let alone hit them. Do you know what I mean? Antonio didn't score outside the box. Well, he scored like one in four years outside the, the box. The one at Silkeborg as well, where he turned and hit it from 20 yards and it, it went in uh, as well. Is that the, sorry, I think it might be that one I'm Silkeborg thinking of. One, not yeah. the, yeah, it's not the Anderlecht. Obviously, he scored a good goal at Anderlecht, but the Silkeborg yeah. one is the one I meant that from outside the box and he smashed yep. it in. Mm. Um, you just wouldn't see those from Antonio. And it's almost like, oh, this is weird. That bloke who's playing up front for us like, keeps shooting at the goal. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. I remember. That's what, yeah, that's what a striker is. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what I remember now. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just think, uh, it's, all right, after a while, because he's not going to have that many chances. We're not going to be able to create that many chances against other teams. So there is an element of, well, you're not going to be able to have 20 shots on goal when we play, certainly when we play Liverpool this week, or certainly when we play plenty of other teams away from home. Arsenal, Man City, Chelsea, you know, all of those. When we go to those places away, I know I've been to Chelsea already, but, you know, Tottenham, Man United, whatever. You, you'd be lucky if maybe you get three shots, four shots in the game. So you do need to be a bit more clean. I understand that. But consider it a process and you just go, oh, well, at least he's having, at least our centre forward is having some shots. Some of them have gone in already. So his confidence is obviously high. I think it's another symptom of that, the fact he's having lots of shots. Um, and it is annoying. It is annoying that one of the others didn't go in. But I think he can do it. And I think him shooting more. Yes. I mean, this is a, this is a absolutely groundbreaking football take right here, Jonesy, but um, the, 
yeah, the takeaway I've got from this is if your striker has a lot of shots, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're not wrong, mate. I think you're absolutely groundbreaking wrong. tactical yeah. analysis. Yeah, you bang on with that insight, hundred percent. Um, like the, the, the good thing is, is that he's not he's not afraid to have a go. Um, and I think I mentioned it last week. Was it the week before? Um, he could score. He can score different types of goals as well. He's got that in his locker. He's not mm. just a tapping merchant, for example. He's not just good in the air. Um, like he can score so many different types of goals, and he shows that in every game he's played. Like he, he'll try anything. Um, there was one one effort he had against Southampton where he just took deflection and went over the bar. Mm. That deflection doesn't happen. That's in the top corner because he's what eight yards out. Um, keeper isn't going to save it because he's, he's hit it pretty well. Um, so that's just unlucky. He's just taken a taken a little clip off someone's knee. Um, but he could have had that trick against Southampton. He could have had that trick against Fulham. So yeah, like. I think he's a very, very good player. He's the striker that we've been missing. There were some fears earlier on that, particularly when he wasn't getting game time, um, Moyes was being a little bit, a little bit, you know, careful with bedding him in, that he was going to be another Sebastian Haller. Uh, I've seen enough in the last three games that absolutely not. He fits the system that David Moyes wants to play. Yeah, um, and <clears throat> he is a real threat. He, he can hold the ball up. He can, you know, link up play with Piquetta's getting better with every game, and with Bowen. Um, like he's a real threat for us and he's going to call, cause defenders all sorts of bother this season. Um, I still don't think he's at 100% at his best. I still think he's still getting used to the game. But that's in, okay, in isn't it? Country. He's like scoring a couple of goals on the oh, way, which it. is a positive. But, but that's the positive is that I still don't think he's at his best and he's always scored 16-13 in, in all competitions. Yeah. And he hasn't started all of those 13 games either. A lot of them, a lot of those appearances have been 10 minutes off the bench at the end of games. So, the fact he's not at his best and he's still causing, uh, he's still the threat that he is that we're seeing, and he's scored six goals already. Um, I think we've got we've got a really really superb strike on our hands. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy with him. So happy with him. It's yeah. just good. And like you said, just a striker that shoots. He's shooting at goal, like at mm. goal. Yeah. It's lovely. <laughs> it's, it's it's great. It's really good. Uh, Absolute madness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it's sad, isn't it, eh? It's so sad. All these years, just like, that's how deprived we've been that we're just at that stage now where we're grateful for other centre forward who shoots. But I, I know some, I know some people so do this. Far our levels of, sorry, go on, mate. Some people might be listening going, yeah, well, you know, Antonio has scored 58 Premier League goals for us and he's our top scorer in the Premier League. So he shoots yeah, as well. 15 it's like, years. It's like, yeah, but, like there's been so many chance, so many times in Antonio's career as his own, our only striker, our only attacker, yeah. um, where he hasn't shot anywhere <laughs> half as much as he should do. But that yeah. is because he's not a natural striker. He's no, precisely. Yeah, he's yeah, a winger. Yeah. That's yeah. what we bought him for all those years ago to be a winger. He ended up being a, a right back, and then yeah. he ended up being a striker. So that's not his natural instincts. Whereas Skamaka. His natural instinct is is to score goals. He is a striker. That's what he was put on this earth to do. I'm convinced of it. So, like, that's what he does. That's his job. That's what he was born to do. And um, he's currently doing it, and he's getting better yeah. at it, and I'm loving it. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Right, so five um, – well, no, we started with uh, f a back five or a back three and two wing backs, um, but we decided to use – of those five, just to fill four of them with fullbacks. So uh, Emerson started at left wing back, Vladimir Sufau at right wing back, and then the back three of Aaron Cresswell on the left, Thilo Kerr in the middle, and Ben Johnson on the right. Kerr uh, was bought as much of a for us as a centre back as, as he was a right back. Well, he was primarily bought. I think that's why, because he's versatile, he can play mm -hmm. both positions. So he played in the middle of that three. Um, and like you said, Jones, you to only concede one with with what can generally fairly be considered a, a fairly makeshift backline. Obviously, the injury to uh, Angelo Ogbonna um, on Thursday, I believe that was, and then he was on the bench, uh, Ogbonna. But clearly, Moisey not thinking he was ready. Um, Nayef Agued, as we know, injured at the beginning of the season before he'd uh, you know played had a chance to play a competitive game, which was bad luck. Um, so they did well on on that front. Um, you know, no huge ricks. Cresswell's played in that position plenty of times, so I never have any fears there. Ben Johnson also proving that he's adaptable, which is great for a young player. Um, 
And it's really good to see how I personally think that, you know, it's good to see how seamlessly Ben Johnson is now just considered Mm. Uh, a, a safe pair of boots or a safe pair of hands whenever he pulls on a West Ham shirt. So for a player that's so young to come through our academy, you know, I don't think perhaps that's getting quite as much praise or or whatever as it may do uh, at other times. So brilliant to see Johnson doing well there. I want to speak to you about Vladimir Sufaldo, Jonesy. Now, I sent you a tweet late last night that I saw um, on Twitter, funnily enough. It's where I see most of my tweets. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kufal literally talked about how fans abusing him ruined his confidence at other clubs. It's not on. He absolutely loves playing for us and having him delete tweets is so embarrassing. Um, I am not sure the context of this, to be honest, Jonesy, because I haven't managed to see... Um, I, I haven't managed to see what it was that he deleted, but the impression I get was that he tweeted something after the Southampton game um, and that he got a load of stick and has deleted something. Do you know any more about this? No, I, I didn't see his initial tweet. Um, like you, I'm assuming it was uh, just your obligatory post-match. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we go again next week. Good hard-earned yeah. point um, that they all put out after a game. Um, and... The first I heard of it was everyone going, oh, I can't believe he's deleted his tweet. Fans should be embarrassed. Fans should be ashamed of themselves. And I did see one fan tweet a thread of things I'd rather do than see Soufal play for West Ham again. And it was just a little bit, just a little bit silly. Things like drown. He was putting things like, I'd rather drown. I'd rather die and stuff like that. And it's just like, it was like a 10 point thread of things he'd rather do. Um, and that fan, I think, I think, I think it was that fan ended up closing his account down because he got a hell of a lot of stick from other West Ham fans just going, mate, mm. sort your life out a little bit. Um, and then, but it sounds like that there were a lot of fans that, um, just piled in on Sue Fowl for, for whatever reason. Um, after the game on his tweet, I don't, I don't know what the tweet said, but I'm sure it was positive. Yeah. Um, and he's felt the need to delete it. He's as tweeted this morning with some love heart emojis and the cross hammer emoji, um, yeah. which suggests that, you know, he hasn't hurt his feelings. Um, and I can't imagine much would hurt Soufal's feelings. But um, clearly... Yeah, you say that. But, you know... I, I say that in jest. I say that in jest, obviously. But, he's felt the love, much. hasn't he? So the fact, is, the fact is that, you know, he's felt the need to delete a tweet based on uh, off the back of fans criticising his performances for West Ham. Right. Um, or not so much criticising, I'm, I'm sure that there was abuse. The fact that other fans are going, those fans should be ashamed of themselves, suggests that it wasn't just criticism, it was abuse. Because players are open to criticism. They're footballers in the public eye. Mm. Um, fans pay money to go and watch them. So the criticism is fair enough. If a player is a bad, is in bad run of form or whatever. Um, but just, just pure abuse is uncalled for. Um, mm. You just shouldn't be doing that sort of stuff. Um, but unfortunately, it's the world we live in. There are people that think it's absolutely fine to do that when they're behind a keyboard uh, and they're online. Um, yeah, it needs to stop. But the fact is, is that one of our one of our players who we support has been attacked by other fans on social media. Essentially, that's what I'm led to believe. Um, and for me, that's not on. Like, you just shouldn't be doing it. Like, what are you gaining out of that? Hmm. No, I've, I, 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 yeah, I, I agree. To be honest, I mean, I, I always find it hard to relate to um, <clears throat> when I see abuse of anyone towards players or whatever it is on on Twitter. I always find it really hard to relate because I just think oh, I've got better things to do in my life. <laughs> I've got better, so I can never really put myself in a position. I know you like it; you don't mind a Twitter beef, do you? Not I'm saying you go out and abuse people, but you don't mind. I, I like a rant, so and if someone someone comes yeah. at me, I'll go back at them. But yeah, I'm not going to start <laughs> abusing um, West Ham players. West Ham players, on I mean, I've I've sent your terrible tweet to David Gold over the years, but that's <laughs> I'm not I'm not attacking him personally. I'm just going, Dave, you got to sell the club, mate. You got to sell the club, uh, or sack it, whoever it is, yeah. sacking. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. but beyond that, I'm, I'm not tweeting Soufal, get out of my club, or whatever was said to. I don't know what was said to him, but you know, you can imagine that's kind of along the lines that was was being mm. said. Um, it's just not on. Like just... he didn't even. I mean, he didn't. He didn't play terribly against Southampton, did he? He has his form has been off this season. Yeah. Also worth remembering, though, to any people giving him stick 
the guy, the guy cost five million pounds. Mm. So I was talking to someone the other day and saying, even if he never has a good game for West Ham again, he has more, more than paid his money 100%. back to West Ham. Very much like Fabian Balbuena. Cost three million quid, had an outstanding first season, and then it fairly quickly became apparent, oh, yeah, okay, that's why you cost three million pound. Yeah. Mm. If the same happens with Soufal, then he... He will always, he should rightfully so, always be a, a well remembered, well loved cult hero uh, because I, he's been fantastic and it, he's five million quid. Like, you know, I, yeah. I just don't understand. And I think also when you factor in, factor in that, and I think you bang on exactly what you just said, when you factor in the fact that he's, he's, he's worked so hard to um, kind of buy into the ethos of the football club. And hmm. kind of, he's given absolutely everything for us since he arrived. Um, it's never, it's made it no secret that you know he's living out his dream playing in the Premier League, playing for West Ham. He even hmm. wrote in his little blog that you know he couldn't believe his luck that he that he managed to join a Premier League football club. Yeah. Um, and he's and in to repay the club in 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 putting the trust in him to sign him in the first place, he's given us hundred percent every time. You know, and he's the most humble player you'll have. You know, there's pictures hmm. of him get, getting a bus home from training. The yeah, guy, I was just going to say just, that the guy gets the tube and the bus. You can't yeah, abuse right. him. The, the guy is he's not. He's not. He's not just you know a, a good servant for the club. I know he's only been there for uh, been here for a couple of years, but just a genuinely nice man. Yeah, just a exactly. genuinely nice man. And when you're giving someone like that abuse because they're having you know having a bit of bad time at work, like hmm. what are you doing? No. What? Who is clearly still trying his best? It's true. I mean, I, I it, genuinely understand it sometimes when fans give grief to players. You can tell just aren't trying anymore. If you look at it, but like Felipe Anderson, Felipe Anderson, great example. Quite, very, very clearly, just almost lost interest towards the end of his time at the club. Couldn't be bothered half the time. Just looked really real. lazy. Jumped out of tackles the lot. Um, you compare that to to Sue Fowl, who gives one hundred and twenty percent every single game. Uh, regardless if he's in form or not, and he's getting the same amount of abuse, or you know there are still people abusing him. It's like, come on, like the guy needs support. He's yeah. words of encouragement, you know. Um, and he's not for some reason he's not had that off a few a few fans. I mean, the reaction to his tweet this morning, loads of fans telling him they love him. Um, but the fact is that shouldn't have happened in the first place, should it? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean, we should we shouldn't need to reinforce the fact that oh no no. Vlad, we do like you, mate. Like, we, we do love you as a fan. Yeah, mate. like it shouldn't we shouldn't need to be telling him that because he no, should know. That, really. Precisely, and I just think there's clearly such a difference in players who are just going through a bad time but still are gutted about it, and would are still clearly trying their best as Soufal is, and compared to Philippe, is a great example. But how many players have we had in the past? Oh, loads. Who've taken yeah. that approach, just sulky, shrugging. Don't give a stuff about playing for West Ham. Don't really give a stuff about putting any effort in and all that sort of thing. Those players, I mean, really, if you're going on, if you're abusing people on Twitter, give your head a wobble anyway. Mm. Um, I do include you in that, Jonesy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, go, go and have dinner with your mates or watch telly or just do anything more. Like, it's a mindset. Going thing, on Twitter yeah. and just typing thing. things yeah. into the ether. But... Uh, you know, if you if you don't incline like anyway, the guy's clearly trying his best. And if you think you're doing a good thing for the club by giving one of our you know hardest working, most humble players who just wants to do well and has done really well was an integral part. Would have been one of the first names on the team sheet when we got to a Europa League semi final last mm -hmm. year. If you're giving that bloke a bit of abuse because you're having a bit of a bad form and you think you're doing something funny or brave or clever or, or most importantly, something that's good for the club and the player, then, yeah, have a, have a word with yourself, mate. Um, Jonesy, the to Vladimir Sufal's um, Czech brother-in-arms, Thomas Suchek, form also been a little bit iffy for a while. Seems to have picked up a bit the last couple of games. The, the heat sort of uh, off of him a bit less. He was uh, wrestled to the floor after Roman Perot's Actually, no, we won't do that. We'll do the goal first, uh, Southampton's goal. So, uh, first of all, lots of people moaning about it being a foul throw from Carl Walker-Peters. 
as soon as I saw it, I thought, well, it's not because some of his foot is on the line. That is the rule. That was confirmed last night again on match of the day. Some of his foot was still on the line. So the foul throw, no problem with that. The problem that David Moyes had, Jared Bowen appeared to have, um, was that the referee, Peter Banks, I think I'm correct in saying the on-field ref. Yeah, um, yeah, was uh, seemed to be stood in his way. The ball appeared to be going towards Bowen. Uh, the referee got in his way, inadvertently you'd have assumed, but he did get in his way, which certainly impeded Bowen and his ability to get to the ball, which Roman Perot picked up. And he fired into the bottom left corner via a deflection, I might add, off of a West Ham defender uh, to put Southampton 1 0 up. Um, the laws of the game state, which we need to sort of make clear, is that the play should only be stopped or the referee is only deemed to be interfering if the ball strikes him. Now, I, obviously, I understand that, but that isn't, that sort of suggests that. If it doesn't strike you, then there's no way you can be interfering, which is obviously not true, as we saw yesterday. Thoughts on on that situation, James? Um, I was of the same view as you with the with the foul throw. It wasn't a foul throw; it was legal. Um, but Peter Banks getting in the way, like Jared, if he's not standing there, Jared Bowen either stops Perro from getting a shot on, or he, he beats Perro to the ball. Yeah, right. Um, or at least delays the shot, completely changes just the trajectory of it all. Yeah. Fact is, Peter Banks is get, gets in his way, and and that's it. Um, I struggle to understand how that cannot be seen as as obstruction uh, or interfering with play. Like obviously, the ball strikes him, and and the ball um, changes possession, then he has to stop the game. If the ball strikes him, it doesn't change possession, then he doesn't have to stop the game. Um, but. Because it's a 50-50 challenge, Peter Banks' positioning almost decides who then takes possession of the ball because the ball's just coming out of the air. I thought you meant Peter Banks' challenge on Jared Bowen. No, was 50. no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it might as well have been. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Away. He shielded him. Um, yeah. But like, because the ball's coming out, obviously it's a terrible, terrible clearance from Suchek. Miss kicks it. But no, no one's in possession of the ball after Suchek touches that ball because it's, it's intended to be a clearance. So, therefore, Such, um, Bowen and, and Perro... Powerful clearance, by the way. Yeah, yeah. rubbish. Um, Perro and Bowen are both going for a 50-50 ball. Whoever gets there first is, is better off. Um, it's no longer 50-50 when Peter Banks is standing right in the way of Jared Bowen. All right. Therefore, is not fair in reply? Hmm. Is not fair in reply? In a key area of the pitch, which then leads to a goal. I mean, I, I just don't know... Like, why they've seen that and gone, yeah, but we didn't touch it, so it's not interfering with play. He stopped Jared Byron from getting to the ball, yeah. which is there to a goal. Yeah. So, uh, again, because it's the letter of the law, um, and, you know, he's probably thinking it would have been a bit harsh on Southampton, which I, I kind of get because if... But then it's also harsh. He, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't have known, right, in the moment, he wouldn't have known how much... He did or didn't affect it, right? And I think the Danny Murphy made a good point on match of the day and said, Well, first of all, and it's easy, he said, Oh, Jared Bowen's too nice there, as in he should have cleared the referee out. And <laughs> is he no, 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 I, I understand what you're saying. He wasn't having mm. to go at him, he was just sort of he worded it like that. Uh, and I was of the opinion, yeah, yeah, that would have been ideal. But then all right, so split second thing, Bowen's not just gonna smash into the back of the referee, like <laughs> You know, no, but he may have done, but he's not. It, Bowen wouldn't know what we now know in that split second, would he? He wouldn't no. know that Perro's going to pick it up. He wouldn't see all the angles. It's easy to go, oh, yeah. Well, why didn't he just clear the ref out? Well, you know, he didn't. Perro still gets the ball and scores there, though, doesn't he? Yeah, is it, but what I'm saying is, right, no, no but maybe he does. But I genuinely think if Bowen smashes into the back of the referee... And Bowen goes down, and so does the ref. I think he he blows up. I genuinely think he blows up because I also reckon that it, it would have affected Perro. But Bowen does sort of like back up and stop, doesn't he? So it kills his momentum, so he can't get as close to Perro as as he could have done anyway. Um, and it also makes it seem for the referee that it was less bad than it actually was, if that makes sense. So by if Bowen just smashes into the back of him and they both go down, 
because Bowen did slow down. If Bowen had carried on at the same trajectory, but he only slows down because the ref's in the way. No, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm I am I'm aware of that, which is why I think, yeah, it it should have been. I I I'm with you. I I don't think it's fair that that goal stood. I appreciate why there's a bit of grey area, and I probably it, it's not real. Is it the sort of thing that you'd expect VAR to to send him over to have a look at? But I yeah. don't know if it works like that. Does it? All right. There's not a foul, or a, but I suppose it could be a considered a. Cl- but it's, it's not a clear and obvious error because the ball hasn't struck him. So there's nothing in the laws to say that. So I, I, I sort of get why it was given. I think it's a clear and obvious error honest. when you consider the fact that he's he obviously isn't aware how the the run of Jared Bowen and how close mm. he was actually to get into the ball before he gets in the way of Jared Bowen. So if you look, he looks at the monitor and goes, well, yeah, actually, if I wasn't standing there, if I wasn't in Jared Brown's way, Jared Brown likely beats Perro to the ball or at least stops him shooting, which means that there's no goal. Mm. Like, if he sees it back, he realises that he was interfering with play, regardless of whether he touched the ball or not. Um, and that's just, yeah, I've, I'm, it just Fair. baffles me that they, that they haven't even looked at it. They haven't even gone, Pete, mate, have a look at that, mate. I, I just I, I understand. I think it falls into that really weird grey area. It's a proper unique situation, anyway. My opinion is that he definitely has impacted that there, uh, but that he hasn't broken a um, any clear and obvious. It's not like a clear and obvious law breach because the ball hasn't hit him. <clears throat> so I, I do understand. It's annoying. It's irritating. But I don't think it's as like bad as some of the actual decisions we've seen in the last few weeks. I, no. Yeah, I, I, I get it. But uh, Thomas Suchek penalty uh, hauled down by a pero, I think it was, in the box. I say hauled. Uh, they were adamant, Danny Murphy and Martin Keown, adamant that it was a penalty on match of the day last night. It's one of those, if that gets given, you're not at all surprised. I think Suchek was kind of like going for the header anyway and a little bit off balance. Did you think that was a, a complete and utter stonewaller? Um, we've seen them given. Yeah, which yeah. is the, which is the that problem. isn't why I asked though, Jonesy. No, I mean, was it Stonewall? Probably not. But uh, yeah, I, I, as I said, you've seen them given. Like, mm. I don't think it was Stonewall, but this is the problem: is that when you've seen them given, they should always be given yeah. because, like, that's you've, as soon as you give one of those, you have got to give them all, really. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not as annoyed. That it wasn't given than than some fans. Like I just think, yeah, well, you know, we were we were very fortunate to get f- against Fulham in that one of their one of Fulham's players just thought it was great just to keep fouling one of ours for a penalty. Um, that wasn't the case here. That was like, more of a pen than the. It was more of a one. pen, yeah. Um, but we were just fortunate in that it was just Pereira just being stupid and just constantly doing it. This was just a one-off. Um, they are missed those ones. They shouldn't be missed because we've got the beauty of VAR. Um, but yeah, I, like if it was given, I don't think Southampton fans or Southampton players or manager could have been that annoyed by it. No. Especially the after they, time, yeah. the refs virtually played a one-two with their striker to set them up for their first goal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah it, would have, it would just even things out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, right, last one, very quickly then, Jonesy. Declan Rice, who, um, you know, I had the complete audacity to say wasn't world-class going forward a few weeks ago, which got me loads <laughs> of abuse over on our YouTube channel. Um, weirdly enough, I'm still of that opinion. Uh, nice goal, nice little one-two, excellent finish, bent into that bottom right corner to salvage a point. Uh, head over to the West Ham fans, uh, did the old knee slide thing, the worst celebration, by the way, hate a knee slide. Um, it also was one of those where it looked a bit too dry for one. I really, really reckon it hurt his knee. A big old clump of the mud came out. Um, yeah, it's not my favourite celebration. St- gave it the old kiss in the badge. Um, which I know loads of fans love. And I was like, come on, look how happy he is to be at this football club. Mm. Um, And, but uh, yeah, I was a bit like, I would have probably preferred like to scoop the ball out of the net and say, come on, let's, let's go again. Like as in to actually go for the win. (laughs) It wasn't a last minute winner in a cup final, but that did sort of see, um, see how it was, it was celebrated. (laughs) 
he said about it like that because he's hit it from 25 yards and it's curled in the bottom corner. Yeah. Like, that's that's why he's gone like that. Like if, if that's a tap in from two yards out, that ball's straight back on the centre circle as quick as possible. But he's yeah. Got, He's gone. Uh, right. He's gone. Well, I get that from twenty-five yards, and he's hit well. Like, it was a yeah. very, very good goal. Yeah. So, um, thoughts so on yeah. kissing the badge? Um, well, his last two goals, he kissed the badge in Leon, didn't he? That was his last yeah. goal. Um, so his last two goals, he's kissed the badge, showing Chelsea fans how, how desperate he wants to play for Chelsea by doing that, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so no, like, look, it, it, it's very obvious that he, he's, he loves playing for the club, loves being captain. Mm. Um, I'm not surprised that. He does that it doesn't change the fact that he's probably going to leave in the summer. You're uh, the sort of player you do love a bit. You do love. I mean, badge. I do. You're in love I mean, with Kara because he like hyped the fans up once. When I saw the celebration, because I, I missed the goal actually, because uh, the website I was watching the game on um, happened to me again, just flicking through the internet, and suddenly the game pops up on a on the <laughs> um, it, it it froze, and I was like, oh no! So I had to find another website that just happened to be showing the game. And then, <laughs> And then as it, as as I found one, it just popped up and it was one 0 and I was like, oh yeah, he scored. So I had to wait a little while to see the goal. So I didn't see the celebration straight away. And then I saw the celebration. I was like, oh wow, like he really does love West Ham, yeah, doesn't he? What, what a nice right bloke. And it just it it, it made me feel really <laughs> proud like... that we've got Declan Rice on our team, captain us, scoring yeah. goals like that. And he's he, he he's got those goals in his locker in there. If this is the third one he scored from outside the area for us, I think it's more um, than Antonio, to be fair. Than our actual striker, but no, I mean, um, it, it, still it, not, he's still not world class. That's all I'm saying. Going what? forward, going can, forward. He, uh, no, I don't yeah. think he is. But the fact is, he, he has got those goals in his locker. Mm, so well, hopefully, we'll um, see a few more of them this season. Yeah, yeah. But and is, next he, time, he to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And next time we're fl- fl- flipping, um, playing away at a team who's in the relegation zone, and you've scored an equaliser with 25 minutes to go. Maybe just go and pick the ball up out the net and celebrate the winner like that. <laughs> rather than, rather yeah. Than the, uh, yeah, maybe. But, but maybe I was I was hoping I wanted to a moment, isn't it? I wanted to use that so we ended the section on a positive. And all I've done is been curmudgeonly and miserable about it. <laughs> um look, one all away at Southampton, maybe two points lost rather than one gained. Uh three wins from ten, West Ham twelfth. On 11 points um, could have been the heady heights um, of where would we have been? You know, our goal is still pretty Ninth. pants, isn't it? So, no, no, we wouldn't have been. We would have been 10th if we'd have won that game. Level one points with Brentwood, <laughs> Brentford and Bournemouth. But, hey, 12th it is. Liverpool away on Wednesday. No problem whatsoever. 